Uh, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so, so one of the ideas was uh, we get a lot of equipment that we would like to test um, prior to it going on sale. And in the UK, as you guys can imagine, that isn't always easy. You know, sometimes we can go several weeks, a month without any clear sky. So we wanted a test bed for, for equipment. Um, we wanted somewhere where we would get guaranteed, well, as much as anything is guaranteed, uh, clear skies. And at the same time, we wanted to make the data available to, to the public. You, um, we, we wanted to give people access to this data. So on those cloudy nights, people can have a go at processing it. Um, we've had various talks so far where we've had some demos of, of processing that data. Um, and, and we really just wanted to open it up to the community and um, invite people to suggest targets, things that they maybe can't reach from the UK. And we also want to be reactive with it. So um, uh, if there's special events happening, if there's interesting things going on, we would like to be able to point, point the scope there and um, make, you know, uh, give people access to that data as quickly as possible. Um, <laughs> children in the background, apologies. Um, the other side of this is that we haven't really got into yet is the, the science side. So we've had a lot of talks during lockdown about various citizen science projects that we'd like to get involved in and we'd like to help the community get involved in. So the next phase of the, the remote observatory project is to dedicate some of the time to, to specific citizen science type projects. Um, it's not, you know, it's not, not professional grade, but certainly citizen science grade. And again, make the data available so we can work on it collaboratively with people. So um, again, we're open to suggestions there. The, the other side of it, um, which is developed quite nicely during lockdown, is, is the outreach side. So um, I've used it with my local society, which is Lecture from District Astronomy Society. Um, we've done some live stacking um, quite a few times now during lockdown at the end of our sort of um, monthly meetings. And that's been really, really good fun because we haven't been able to do the, the, the sort of public stuff at our observatory in, in Letchworth. Um, so this has been sort of a nice uh, antidote to that. Um, it's not the same as looking for an eyepiece, but it's been good fun from a social point of view and, you know, to, to talk about some of these objects as the image appears on the screen. Um, it, it's been, yeah, it, it's worked very well. Um, so we're in the south of Spain, um, in, in not too far from Granada, in a place, place called Castilleja. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, I can't pronounce it. Castilleja, um, which is the Pixel Sky site, um, remote hosting site there in Spain. And um, they're in a, a very dark location. Um, I think it's recently been awarded... Um, uh, some some protection um, as part of the UNESCO World Geopark Network. Um, they're about six kilometres away from the nearest village. There's very little light pollution, and um, yeah, it's it's you know very well placed for for remote um, use. So that's that's where we are. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so they're they're big roll off roof um, type enclosures um, and each one I think can house eight to ten setups something along those sorts of lines um, and there's a satellite internet uplink so we're able to download the data and, and remote on to control everything um, there's another another shot of it um, all looking very nice and clean and splendid there because it's it's relatively new site um, this is this is inside and we've we we were quite careful in what we decided to send over we didn't want to send very very high-end glamorous stuff that was maybe out of the reach of, of most people we wanted to send something that could actually be you know a, a reasonably attainable setup um and at, at that point in time we just started um selling 10 micron mounts so the mount is a, a 10 micron gm 1000 and the telescope is one of our own um which is again one of the purposes for, for doing this was to, to give us a place to test the telescope and it's a it's a hundred and four mil triplet um, with very nice glass and um, and then on the back we're using again it's it's, it's a tried and tested um, CCD camera which is a six nine four and and the reason for that was it's it's incredibly sensitive and it's very very low noise so it gives some really nice smooth images and some fantastic data for people to to to, to work on. Um, 
we're using a set of Optolon filters. Uh, we're using a Lodestar because it's the best uh, guide camera you can get still. Um, very sensitive. And the thing on the front of the scope is, uh, I was just explaining to Dave, it's called a flip flat, which is a remote controlled flap that can also be used as a, um, a light source for taking your flat images. So again, for remote operation, it just, it just means we can do everything remotely. Um, we're using a Lakeside Focuser and we're using a Mount Hub Pro um, to control everything. And what else have we got on there? I'm sure I'm missing something, but it, it's, it's worked very well for us. Uh, we sent over our own peer um, as well because we, we, uh, we just started sending Pulsar Observatory. So we wanted to send over a Pulsar peer. So it was, we, you know, we can hand on heart say it's, it's all stuff that, that is ours. Um, so, we, you know, we, we kind of uh, eaten our own dog food, I think is the phrase. Um, maybe it isn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so th that was it all headed over the back end of last year. And um, it then took us a bit of time to get, to get things dialed in and tuned in. Um, the other part of this project was I wanted some experience in having a remote setup. So, um, you know, it took me some time to get, get used to some of the software and to get everything dialed in. So we spent several months testing. And then we decided um, we wanted to change the filter wheel uh, because Starlight Express released the MIDI filter wheel, which has um, seven positions before we only had five positions. We decided we wanted the four-wheel RGB narrowband. So we changed the filter wheel and sort of meant we had to do some of our calibration and stuff again, but at least we've, we've got all the filters we want set up in there now. Um, so we've then been taking data um, pretty much all of this year and I've, I've got quite a collection built up now and we're now releasing it on a, on a quite a regular basis. Um, there's, a, there's some more close-ups of, of the setup. Um, we've also got, I don't think you see my cursor, but we've, we, we wanted to see where the scope was pointing. Um, so we've got a little sky camera that um, my colleague Rob 3D printed a really neat little bracket that clamps onto a dovetail to hold a camera so you can kind of get a get a sense of where the scope is pointing much wider field and that, that that's worked really nicely. Um, jumping ahead a bit, so the first set of data we released was um, 80 hours worth of M16 data. So the other idea with this is that we, because of the number of clear skies we get, we can capture much more data than you would possibly hope to catch in, in the UK. You know, talking to people, 80 hours of data in the UK could be, you know, a year, two year project. Um, so we were able to capture 80 hours in, in a few weeks. And um, this was the first set of data we released, which is, uh, yeah, M M16 Eagle Nebula. And this was a narrow band. Um, so we've got um, hydrogen alpha, O3 and uh, S2 data for this. Um, so far, we've, we've been releasing the stacked integrated RAWs so that then people can take it from there and do what they like with. We decided that releasing the RAWs individually just takes so much space and bandwidth. Um, and actually, there's only so many settings for integrating and calibrating. So it sort of made sense to get everybody to that point and then let people um, do what they like. So this was the first data release, and it was probably about a month ago now we released this. And we ran a processing competition through the Stargate Designers Forum, um, but it's, it's free to anybody. You don't have to be a member to access this, but the competition was really to see who could get the most out of that data and, and make the prettiest picture. So it isn't a scientific competition. It really was a, a pretty picture competition. And this was our winner um, uh, by our member, Spongy. Um, and uh, the reason I really like this is I, I like quite subtle, um, dustiness. I don't like too much contrast. And for me, this was a really nice kind of subtle, um, cloudy kind of image and, and some really nice detail and a really nice control of the colour. Um, but what was really interesting to see is just how many different approaches there are to this, this processing. Um, actually, for, for this, the one we had um, Dave Wheels, who runs the Pixel Skies Observatory, um, do a tutorial showing his workflow and you can actually watch that on YouTube and he's provided his PixInsight um, saved um, workflow and icons so you can kind of follow along if you want to get a, a, some practice at, at using PixInsight. So that was our winner. Um, second place, well runners-up was, was this one. Um, 
which is similar to spongy, just a you know slightly different um, take on it. And then um, this one, which is a, a little bit more blue. And then um, we also had a special mention to this one because it was just so different to, to everything else and just a really interesting spin on it. And, and obviously totally made up colors and everything else. Starless, which is not to everybody's taste, but um, a few of the people on the judging team picked up this one just because it, it just kind of made us think of um, Star Trek was, <laughs> was the main reason for, for that one. Um, Dave's been showing off um, the, the, the most recent data release, and I haven't got any to share with you here yet. Um, but we, we've, the, the next data release is um, 80 hours on um, the Crescent Nebula, and um, that was released a, a couple of weeks ago. And this time we, we coincided the release of a, a talk by um, Gary Palmer, so showing his workflow, which again was Pix Insight, but it is a very different workflow to how Dave does things. And again, it's very interesting to see a different take on it. And that process of competition is, is ongoing at the moment. I think there's another week left and the data is on, on the forum if any of you want to have a go and, and have a look at that. Um, so that's, that's where we, we've got to so far with it. Um, the, the other data we, we've kind of got in hand to be released in the next um, few weeks is um, 80 hours on M17, your Megan Nebula, just to go with M16. And um, we've also got 80 hours of uh, the ghosts of, Cass Cass ghosts of Cassiopeia, IC59 and IC63. And um, that's, that's come out really nice. I've just finished DWB111, which is the propeller nebula. Um, and some of these were just because I saw other people imaging those objects and I kind of really fancied having a go. Um, the next one was a, actually a, a community request, which was for M33. And, and I think M33 can be a tricky target in the UK, um, can be tricky to get enough time on it. It can be, you know, quite faint and, you know, re potentially require some decent seeing, et cetera. So we, we are about halfway through um, M33. So really we're open for suggestions for the next set of data people would like us to have a go at capturing. Um, we're also open for any suggestions around the sort of science projects we, we could look at doing. Um, we're very, very keen to, to set aside some time to, to some citizen science type, type work and, um, and also outreach. You know, uh, I, uh, as I mentioned, we've done a lot for my local society, um, but I'm hoping we can open that up potentially to, to doing some live stuff with, with the forum, but potentially other groups like yourselves. Um, we may even be able to do some of that tonight. Um, desperately looking at the cloud sensor over in Spain, which is, is unfortunately showing the roof is still closed. Um, so that may not be possible, but um, it might be something we can arrange um, later in the year to, to start a little bit later at night or, or when the clocks change. So that's a whistle stop tour of, of what it's about and um, where we've got to so far. And, and like I say, hopefully where we're going next, um, the feedback, has been really incredible so far and, and the participation we've had has is, is, is been fantastic to the extent that we're now contemplating a second setup um, specifically for planetary because looking around um, not many people do planetary setups in remote observatories it tends to be people want deep sky stuff but as we've found over the last you know month or so or certainly as i found and i'm sure you guys would have as well the scene in the uk is absolutely pants at times and you know with the planet so well placed it's been quite frustrating for me to not to be able to get a nice capture myself so i would love to have a longer focal length set up somewhere like um pixel skies where we can get some some excellency in and, and more clear nights to actually get some get some good data and then make that available publicly as well so that's that's where we are that's where hopefully where we're going and um you know the, the participation from the community such as yourselves is is kind of what keeps these projects going and hopefully means I can persuade uh, Steve at First Light Optics to let me do more of them because in my ideal world I would have lots of these so uh, yeah um, so yeah that's that that's me um, happy to answer any questions thanks so much Grant fantastic yeah Good stuff. Yeah, as you can see, the background behind me is the Crescent Nebula. You wouldn't, probably wouldn't recognise it from uh, from that image because there's so much detail captured in it. You can't really see the Crescent. 
I mean, it doesn't, it's worth saying, I, I don't think remote setups like this replace doing it for yourself. I still have a, uh, you can't see because of my background, but I, I still have a, um, a setup in the UK. I really enjoy that kind of um, process of setting up in, in the garden and trying to get stuff for yourself. And I don't think it replaces looking for an IP. So I just think it's something else. You know, I think it's a very broad hobby we have and it's, it's all good fun. Grant, yeah. the, uh, because you've got 80 hours of data on these images, is that using multiple scopes or just one scope? So at the moment it's just using the one scope and it, it's, it's, just, it's just purely because we get so many clear skies over there. Um, and I mean, I mean, to be honest, there's, there's, there's times where I think I'm possibly capturing too much data for an object and you get to the point where it's maybe not adding anything. Um, uh, and I think as I get more experience with it, I'll probably, um, you know, some objects I might get less, some I might get more, um, but certainly so far, 80 hours. Actually, the Eagle Nebula was 100 hours, but I ended up then killing quite a lot of subs that I'd taken during when it was a bit too moonlight and they weren't really adding any value. So, um, you know, there's, there's a bit of experience for me there. Thank you. Grant. Uh, how do you want with purity and electricity and things like that where you work? Because I'm presuming you're quite isolated. Is there? Yeah, I mean, they have, um, so they've got very heavy duty UPSs <laughs> and they've got, um, I, I think there's, there's solar there. There is mains electricity. It's not so far off, off the beaten track. It's, um, so they do have mains electricity, but they also have to have um, backups and um, uh, they rely on satellite internet which does mean it's a it, it's a little bit laggy at times um so it's it's yeah it's, it's kind of a good mix really i think what i've been told and i was hoping to get there physically this year for a visit um but what i've been told is it's not somewhere you go for a, a holiday um unless it's an astronomy holiday um because it's you know there's no touristy things nearby so um good I, for me <laughs> yeah and and there is uh, they do have accommodation on site and and they live nearby in um cave houses actually which are, are just just up the road from the observatory which is pretty cool so it, is there an opportunity to be able to go on a what if i wanted the phrase um i i don't know they do do courses and things like that on sites and 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 they do have accommodation i mean it's worth having a look at um their website pixelskiesastro.com um so you can book accommodation there in one of their cave hotels um, and you can take kit with you and dave you know dave will, will help with courses um dave's a, a an image processing guru and very very experienced with equipment because how the process works um they do the setup for you and i feel very guilty about this um <laughs> all we did was literally ship a load of stuff over and and dave and um colin um just just do everything and they do such a good job of the cabling it really puts my cabling into shame um but they they know what's required to make a scope work reliably remotely which is maybe not something we all think about, um, you know, the cable snags and bits and pieces like that. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very experienced. And uh, you, you may, you guys may have met them. They, they do come over. Um, they were at Astrofest and uh, they were also at IIS as well. So they, they do come over here. They're, they're both expats. They're both from the UK originally. Um, I'll put a link for that on the uh, website. Cool. as well so we've all got that there i think I've, I've messaged dave to see if he will um if he'll open the the roof for us so if it opens i will uh i'll give you a shout uh, i'm watching the screen i don't know how how long people have got um i'm also very happy to show you the the, the remote desktop if people are interested and show you the software we're using and, and and stuff like that you're more than welcome to see um, it just depends how interesting that is to people. It's interesting to me because I'm a I'm a I'm a geek on these kind of things, but I know it's not um, looking at software isn't everybody's cup of tea. It'll be interesting to see it. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, got um, a thumbs up there from uh, Tony. Okay. Yeah. All right. Definitely. I'm just going to stop sharing and then uh, share the remote desktop instead. Uh, have you, you've um, done this for Stargazine, I guess, Grant. Well, it, again, I embarrassing. Haven't all, I haven't seen all of them. Um, and I no, know no. Helen's um, quite big in SGL, isn't she? Has she sort of 
collared you to try and get her in Comet observing and yes yeah 67p next year exactly that exactly that so Helen is definitely we've, we've been talking to Helen quite a bit about some of the science stuff that we, we will try and get involved in um, I'm, I'm ashamed to say I haven't done a live share like this where we actually um, try and do some live stacking with SGL yet and that's simply because we do the SGL talks on a Sunday night so by the time they finish um, Sunday night is a, a school night and uh, with the kids and stuff I, I'm loath to stay up too late on a Sunday night so um, I, I suspect once the clocks change it will um, we'll do a lot more of this um, uh, and, and I hope we will be able to do some um, specific nights where we, we do almost like a virtual um, star party. Um, in fact, we were using this as a backup on Saturday for International Observe the Moon Night, but you know, of all our luck, it was cloudy in the UK and cloudy in Spain. So we, um, we got about a 10 second live view of the moon from Spain mm -hmm. and that was, that was our lot, unfortunately. Um, so um, you can, hopefully you can see the screen as it stands. It's a PhD is knocking around, but that's, we're not interested in that at the moment. Um, what we were interested in at the moment is the the cloud watcher stuff. So, the remote um, the observatory themselves have the web weather stations. So this isn't our kit, but they let you um, tie into them so we can see what's going on over there. So, um, at the moment, unfortunately, it's just dipped into the slightly cloudy. Um, but I'm hoping Dave's going to override it and open the roof for me anyway um, because it's not it's not wet. It's only slightly cloudy. Um, but how it works is there's a there's a 15 minute delay. Um, from the point it changes to clear before the roof opens. And that's to stop the roof opening and closing all night long. So if you can imagine a little bit of passing cloud and the roof would close and then it would open. So there's just a little bit of a delay built into that, um, which caught us out at the beginning a few times where the weather station was saying it's clear and we couldn't see anything through the scope. Um, and it was because the roof wasn't open. So now there's a little app that we also have, which just tells us exactly what the roof's doing, um, which is quite handy. Um, so hopefully, as I say, Dave will, Dave will override that. Um, everything over there is on two IP, um, which is internet controlled uh, power switches. So there's one for the mount and there's one for the Mount Hub Pro and then everything else then hangs up the Mount Hub Pro. So um, this is what I do on a daily and well, twice a day basis. I log in in the morning and check what it did the night before and I power it all off. And then I log in in just early evening, power it all on and then set, set things going. So it's, it could be more automated than that, but I like to kind of see what's going on. I like to be logging in once or twice a day and just monitor what, what, what's what. Um, so I've already switched on um, the focus controller and the camera. And we've got one Jew band on it. Not that I, I think it particularly needs it, but we, we have one anyway, just as a, just in case. And that's also turned on. So we, we know we're all powered up and ready to go. Um, the software we use for control is Sequence Generator Pro. Um, that's what we started with. And then we, we had a go at switching to Voyager. And um, I don't know if you guys have, have used either of those, but I found Sequence Generator Pro a lot more logical to use than Voyager. And, there's a few limitations in Voyager, which I just couldn't get my head around and to do with the way you keep the batches going night to night in Secret Generator Pro. It will remember the progress you've made on each um, job um, target. Um, whereas in Voyager, you, you kind of have to tell it. Otherwise, every time you run Voyager, it's, it starts the, the script again from the beginning and doesn't really know where it's already got to. So um, just open Secret Generator Pro. So this is, this is where we are. Um, obviously, I, I, I'm not going to go too much into Zika Generator Pro. It's a, it's a talk all on its, on its own. But we've got M33 set up here. And you can see where we are so far with it. Um, we've taken 40 out of our 40 subs on HA. And they're 20-minute subs. Um, I'm going to aim to get a decent chunk of HA on this to, to bring out those nice star forming areas. And then on the LRGB, I'm running five minute subs, 300 seconds. And so far, you can see the progress. I've got 65 out of 65 of the luminance. And um, hopefully by tonight, I will have got the rest up to 65. And, and what I, I mean, some people do this differently. Some people will go out and try and get all 80 of their hydrogen alphas, then all 80 of their luminance. And then, you know, sequentially like that, I prefer to get 
um, a few of everything and then the next night do a few more. So I kind of build up enough data as I go along. So if something happened, you know, and we lost, had to redo the calibration or whatever, at least we'd have enough data up to that point across all the filters. Um, is that's my logic and I'm and I'm sticking to it and um, yeah so that's that's Super General Pro you can see what's very handy it's got a little planning tool so you can actually tell it to only start imaging when things get to a certain altitude and we typically aim for anything above about 30 degrees and that isn't because of light pollution or anything like that but it's more a case of we, we get so many clear skies in Spain why not use the you know use the best times for the objects we, we can um, I mean even 30 degrees some people might disagree with and go go slightly higher than that but that that seems to work very well for our needs um, uh, yeah so that's that's secret generative pro I will also at times run two objects simultaneously so if an object's quite low down I might just image it for a couple of hours that night and then switch to another object and sequence generator can handle that absolutely fine in fact it's, it just makes it it, it makes it so easy. You, sometimes you just feel like you're you're clicking buttons, um, which is yeah um, why it's still important. I think to have a, a setup in the UK as well. Um, the other really good thing about Sequence Generator Pro, and I, I don't know again if how many of you use it already, is the the framing and um, the framing wizard makes it so nice to frame an object and get it just how you want it. Um, I'll give you a sneak preview of the um, the M33 data. Um, which is coming in. So that's just one sub, and I think it would have been just before the roof um, closed in the morning. You can see our embarrassing uh, dust donuts knocking around, um, but hopefully you can also see there's some some nice potential coming out there with um, with that already. And there's uh, I've also got a red. So again, just give you a sense of the red data. Um, yeah, so that's that's I think that's going to build up quite quite nicely um, and I'm hoping let's see if the roof's open yet uh, not yet no um, um, what we tend to do for live viewing um, as I say, unfortunately the roof's still closed but we, we use a program called Starlight Live and um, it's a really underappreciated program I spent quite a long time looking for some live stacking software we could use for when we're doing some some outreach type stuff and i've really struggled there's quite a bit of software out there but i, I haven't found anything that works hugely reliably and um, we tried sharp cap but we found the performance and it, it kept crashing and we had various issues and there's a few open source pieces of software that look like they've, they've kind of been abandoned or not really been finished whereas starlight live um, works really well um, unfortunately it only works with starlight cameras which is the downside if you have got a starlight camera and want to do some live stacking, it's 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 pretty good. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's just a blank screen until the roof opens. Um, uh, I think unless the roof's going to open, there's there's not much else I can um, I can go for unless people have got any specific things they want to see or ask about. Uh, a question: It's Patrick here. Um, how do you get that amount of data over from Spain to you? Because here in Tissington, yep. we're working with bongos and with uh, pigeons and, uh, and smoke signals. So, so that's quite a bit of data. <laughs> so, so what we use, we use um, a file transfer program called pCloud. And um, I don't know why we chose pCloud other than, um, well, I do know why. I know exactly why. So we, we use Dropbox for other bits and pieces. But the trouble with Dropbox is, um, everybody that you share the data with, it consumes that much space on everybody's Dropbox. So if we've got 20 gigabytes of data, it would require everybody to use 20 gigabytes of data in their Dropbox account. With pCloud, only the file owner uses the space. So it means everybody else we want to sh give access to the data, um, they only need a free P cloud account with the two gig of space, whatever it is, because the data from us doesn't use up their space. They can access it, but it doesn't consume their space. So that's why we use P cloud. Um, but how that works is it will just slowly upload in the background overnight. Um, so by the time I log in in the morning, it's probably already downloaded to my local machine. Um, and that's okay for the 694 because we're doing, the other thing is we're doing 20 minute subs. So, we're not generating, it's not like, you know, the ZWO cameras now where you might be doing three, five minute subs, you know, 
and you're producing loads and loads of data and it's huge frame size. 694 is a, a reasonable size chip, but it's not huge, so they're not too big. And, um, and, and we're doing long exposures, so we're not generating terabytes of data. Um, when it comes to the planetary stuff, the solution there is we're going to stack it in Spain and only download the, um, the stacked raw file. Because uh, as you can imagine, the video files would be colossal. And especially if we're going to leave videos running, you know, long uh, over time to create animations and things like that. Um, so that's the plan for, for that setup. Okay. Oh, see, the roof is open, Grant. Oh, well spotted, Dave. Well spotted. Right. You can now all watch me make a, make a mess of this. Um, hopefully I won't. But uh, Right. So I'm using cart to seal for our control. Uh, I've got the, the mount connected to that. Um, any any takers for objects? Any? Andromeda Galaxy. That's a bit, it's a bit low, is it, at the moment? It, I don't know. It's, no, it's not too bad. Um, shouldn't be. Let's have a look. Where it is in Spain. I thought it was. Uh, where are we? That's okay. Yeah, we can get that. Uh, it's twenty-eight degrees. Yeah. Um, the, the, because it's a roll-off. Um, because it's a roll-off roof. The way it's designed is that the roof has to be able to close at any time without having to tell people you need to slew your mount, park your mount, or anything like that. So the roof's high enough that it can close at any point. What that means is we, we can't really get to anything below about 20 degrees um, because of the position we are in in the observatory, um, which was a little bit of an issue with the um, comets earlier in the year um, at times, but you know, you can work around that. All right, so in theory, we're going to be on Andromeda. Um, I haven't refocused this yet, so let's see what the focus position is like. If need be, I'll refocus it, but that will take a couple of minutes just to, to whiz through that. So. Um, let's, um, let's try a, oh, it's Andromeda, so let's only try a 10 second. Um, when you're live stacking, you tend to bin as well, um, just to be able to build up the data a bit, bit quicker. So let's, uh, let's hit our button and see what happens. See, see, Sean's put something in the uh, chat about LBN treble seven. Okay, we can have a go at that next. Um, yeah, that's an LRGB <clears throat> broadband, you know, really faint. Sorry. Um, bear in mind, it isn't actually clear in Spain. Um, Dave's just opened the roof for me for us to have a little play. So if it looks rubbish, it, it could just be um, the cloud. Uh, so. You're tracking spot on. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is um, unfortunately it's not actually stacking yet either. So let's see what's going on there. Um, ah, helps if I tick the button, doesn't it? Um, a few times when I've done this and it's all crashed, people have particularly enjoyed that um, because it, it kind of shows you that no matter who you are, where you are, what what kit you're using it can all go wrong at any minute um, and you can be fighting windows and you can be pulling your hair out. When they hide little tick boxes like that in another. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So it's starting to stack now. So let's just give it a minute to build up again. This is using the green filter, I see. Uh, it should be the luminance filter. Um, where are we? There, yeah, L filter. I can see the green channel selected. Um, okay, yeah, we're not that, sh that because it's a mono camera. Um, we're not that's just for editing, so that's in the live stack and that lets you edit particular channels. But because we're doing mono, it, it will just be one channel. Um, so I think that's just a, a red, red herring. Um, I suspect our focus, I think I'm going to have to go and focus um, everybody. So, um, you're going to have to watch the very exciting process of focusing. Um, because no matter how parfocal they say the filters are, we all know different. 
and also the temperature would have would have changed a fair bit um, from this morning. This is not the most exciting part of the process, so apologies. Which software is this that you're using in the background to uh, highlight all the uh, objects? Uh, so that's that's the built-in focus routine in Sequence Generator Pro. Um, so what it does, it does an all-star uh, focus rather than on, on one specific star. And what it's telling me is the um, the HFR of each of those stars. And then it takes the average to, to do its V-curve. Um, so it's not actually ideal identifying them um, as such, just, just measuring them. Right. And I have to say, it does a pretty good job, um, although it's <laughs> maybe not tonight looking at that V-curve, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. I found, I found it does struggle sometimes um, with um, globulars. It, it doesn't seem to like the focusing on those so much. Um, I think it needs a, a quite a good spread of stars. Okay, that's not too bad. There we go, that's a bit better. Let's reset Starlight Live and then away we go again and see what happens this time. I found um, where the, um, the live stacking software really excels is on um, narrowband objects. So I left this running for about half an hour on um, Pelican Nebula and the, the image it kind of produced was, was almost a kind of what I would hope to get myself in the UK. It was a really, really nice finished image. Just let this come in a little bit. Bit tighter stars this time. And, um, just, yeah, it's all smooth. Now the trouble we're going to have here is obviously the core, um, which is always a challenge. Mm. Um, and this is one area of the software I think that could be could be improved is the um, the the histogram. Um, so sometimes if you change it to one of the other methods, you can get some slightly better um, better results at, at keeping the core a little bit more under control. Um, We let that just build up for a little bit. Those dust lanes are already starting to come out. I don't know how well you guys can see that on your, your yeah, screens, but that's, that, yeah. it's starting to come through. Um, and, and it's we're up to, what, 10, 10 seconds up so far. This is our temperature coming in. Um, so the longer, longer you leave this, um, And it helps that the, the go-to is pretty accurate and the, um, the tracking is, is also pretty accurate as well. Um, I found before with live stacking, if, if you've got too much drift, it really does struggle to, to, to stack it automatically. There you go, it's already starting to clean up a bit more. Uh, while that's coming in, I'll just check on the chat for the other object. What, what was it, Dave? And I'll... LBN treble seven. LBN treble seven. It's the baby eagle nebula. So just Taurus. We'll let this build up just for a, a minute or two more and just see where we get to. Um, 
don't want to stretch it too much because I think we'll just end up blowing the blowing the core. Um, Certainly a lot better than what you get in Wakefield at the moment. But I've just had a look outside and you just see the moon coming through the clouds in Wakefield. So uh, there's no chance of seeing this tonight. Uh, well, I mean, that is the other thing. That the moon is going to be up in Spain as well. So yeah. um, with, with a bit of cloud as well. I'm, I'm, yeah, um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. But yeah, some dust lanes coming up. Um, you, you kind of get the idea of what it, what it can do. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, it's, I'm quite surprised how uh, I was expecting the field of view to be um, a bit tighter than that actually on Andromeda. That's not that's not too bad. Um, yeah, it's got quite a big chunk of it, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and the satellite galaxy as well. It, it, it was just pure luck that it happens to be perfectly uh, diagonal. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one of the other things that we, we may consider as a, an upgrade is putting a rotator on it because there are some objects where you kind of think, oh, if I could just turn it around a little bit, I might be able to get this in as well. Uh, and at the moment, we don't have a, an automatic rotator on there. Oh. Well, that's cleaning up quite nice. As to, to me, there's some nice detail coming, coming in the lane yeah. here and even down here. Some, the lanes coming around quite nicely. So, should we have a go at this um, LBN? Is that is that part of Taurus? Did you say, Sean? So that's not. Going yeah, to be that's in it. Taurus. I mean, it's just a suggestion for a long, you know, long term. That's a long project, rather than. Oh, okay. As a project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, it's not something very bright. It? It's be interesting, you know, because it's really fine. Probably not one for live viewing then. No, no, no. Okay. No. Well, it took me half an hour just to find out where it was. By by, I, there was just a lack of stars in the area. You know, it, it took like eighteen hours to get anything from it, really. So it's just a it's fine. thought for a long term project, really. Okay, I'll have a look at that one and see what. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what you can get from there. That'd be great yeah. to see. Um, is there any other requests for for live viewing objects? I'm happy to have a little wander around. Um, Globulars are normally quite nice, um, particularly this time of year. What's, some nice... uh, what's, on, what's on the head of um, Pegasus on the no just off the nose of Pegasus? There's one there, isn't there? Thirteen, is it? No, thirteen's in um, Hercules, 13. isn't it? Triangular, triangular uh, galaxy. Yeah, M15, M31. Uh, I heard M15 there. Is that was that? No, M M31. We're on M31. Oh, sorry, M31. Uh, yeah. A triangular, a triangle, triangular nebula. Uh, oh, M33. 33. Sorry, get the wrong. Yeah, name. yeah, yeah that would be a nice one. Um, let's. Um, it might be a little bit low at the moment, but um, let's have a go. Um, It can, because of the slight delay you get with the um, with the satellite with the remote desktop, sometimes it just looks like I don't have a clue where I'm clicking, and it is. I promise it. It's just the delay. Um, well, most of the time it's a delay. Sometimes it is because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, here we go. That might be a bit low for the roof. Let's have a. That's thirty degrees, was it? Oh, eighteen. Yeah, if I just sometimes to cheat, it's it's easier just to run the the guide camera and just see see if you're actually um, yeah. See, we're in the um, bit low for us at the moment. That's why this because uh, we we are imaging M thirty three at the moment, but I'm not generally getting on it until about ten half ten in Spain. Um, which is when it just gets gets that little bit higher. So, uh, um, any any other shouts? Um, sure, we, we could try it in fifteen because that's that's more or less just a bit further west. Okay. Than the Andromeda Galaxy. Have a look. Ooh. 
it's near the star epsilon the Garzai. That's quite nice and high, so that should yeah. be a Thank you. Um, I, I did actually do some nice um, live stacking on the Vale as well before in, in um, Narrowband, and that, that stacked quite nicely. So does it plate solve once it's reached the target um, just to make sure that it's yeah, it, it does. It does when we're doing it in the sequence. That's part that's of the sequence fine. generator pro. But um, because we've got such a, an accurate model for the mount, right? Um, you'll see we don't actually need to for for, for just the live view and stuff. We've, we've, we're always um, very very close. And even when we do it in sequence generator pro, the model's so good that it plate solves once, confirms it's exactly where it expects to be. Um, and then doesn't need to adjust. It's very, very rare it needs to, to adjust. Um, if you start needing adjustments, it suggests we've maybe moved a counterweight or not something or, you know, yeah. and, and need to redo the model. Um, so it does take a while to set these models up in the first place, but it, it's well worth it. coming in I'll also just let it um, I let it guide as well because that's a, a very good test of what the mounts actually up to let a few come in here we go it's starting to appear let's have a little stretch <laughs> So again, the challenge is going to be keeping that core under control. And um, I think that's one of the areas of the software that could, could be improved. Um, some sort of HDR type stretch um, could be very handy. But that's a pretty little globular coming in. Yeah, it certainly shows it. This is a core collapse. Um, globular cluster, so the centre is much more tightly compressed than M13 or or um, or uh, 92, etc. So that's why. Beautiful, yeah. That shows quite strongly, doesn't it? That core being so tight. Yeah, I'm Richard Westwood, by the way. <laughs> Hi. I like I like globular clusters, and that one I looked at quite recently. Beautiful cluster. I think there's some of the be most beautiful things to look at visually as well. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it shows just how quickly you can build up a picture. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, as I said earlier, you know, on, I don't think it replaces live stuff. It certainly doesn't replace that feeling of looking for a, an eyepiece. But at the moment during lockdown, to be kind of sat here talking to you guys and share this, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice replacement while we can't do some of the outreach stuff we would normally or some of the you know visual stuff we would normally it's absolutely great for me because this the scene in wakefield has been atrocious of late i think we've just had a few good days we've had lots of high, high clouds so seeing something yeah. like this is a real cheer up thank you <laughs> i think what, what i've also enjoyed doing this with, with my local society is, is when you know I'm, I'm happy to steer and drive but when people shout out what they want to look at and then there's other people that can kind of chip in and talk about the object like like you were just doing talking about the core collapse there you know i think it's a really interesting way to to learn about objects by sharing that knowledge around between ourselves um, agents just chatted uh p's one in m15 would be a nice project yeah yeah we haven't that's it we haven't um we haven't done a globular cluster yet for the for actual sort of getting getting some more data on one so yeah that, that would be a good shout um i have to say i i'm absolutely rubbish at processing um broadband targets so i've tended to steer more towards the narrowband stuff but um we've, we have had some requests for some more broadband stuff nick i'll see you in the uh tonight have you got any objects in that sort of area that you'd be interested in having a quick look at i'm here um 
Well, Stefan's quintet's always quite fun, but uh, obviously we're using a relatively small aperture apo at the moment. Lovely telescope, super setup, but uh, I would have thought perhaps um, some of these faint stuff might be a bit tricky. Mm. That would be my view, but you know, or the the um, NGC seven three three one. The group. Good. Yeah. Again, the moon might interfere with that too much tonight, though. Galaxy is probably not the best subject for tonight. But overall, yeah, great stuff. Um, where are you? Yeah, Stephen's quintet's quite high, so we could we could have a. Yeah, it's up. It's up in this. Vicinity, it's of Pegasus, isn't it? So yeah, it's still Pegasus. It's north of uh, M15. So, um, but I think they'll be tiny at this scale, won't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we can always do it for for a couple of stacks and just see what comes in. Um, sure. nothing, yeah. well, nothing, yeah. nothing lost. Um, uh, let's try and. Just got to show you how nice that guiding graph is. I'm sorry, but that is uh, I absolutely love that. It's showing off. It's <laughs> it absolutely is showing off. I wish I could get that um, with my old EQ6, that's for sure. Be a bit careful about our placement here. Why am I not? Uh, am I in the right place? And did you see 7320? That's one of them. Maybe it's just a bit, maybe I don't have the enough um, catalogs. Oh, there we go. <laughs> right, if I try and get us there, let's see if we can get, meaning to set up the um the finder in carte de seal so it actually reflects the sensor size so we might have to just have a look and see where we get to um because i think it is bigger than that default one so let's have a look if not i'll move it over a little bit um let's just up this a tiny bit wow one of the, one of the other things we're, we're hoping to do or i'm hoping to do is, is on the second setup is have a wide field um piggybacked lens or scope for outreach with a color camera on because um some of the feedback i've had doing this is you know, can we see some colour? And it's possible with a filter wheel, but it would just take that much longer to, to build it up live. Um, so I would like a, a wide field colour mm. setup. As you can tell, I'm pretty much a kid in the sweet shop. <laughs> As I say, Grant, it doesn't beat that sort of getting out there and setting the scope up and doing it yourself, but it's certainly a great way of getting really, really good data. Absolutely. I, I think yeah. the other thing that, that I've considered doing this as part of this project is, uh, you know, I know several people who can't physically get out and do it themselves now. or um, So this offers a, an alternative for, for those people to still enjoy the hobby in, in, a, in a, you know, a slightly different way. And I think... As time goes on, I suspect that's going to become even more. Um, ah, I know what happened. I didn't restart my guiding, so it's now um, it's had a little uh, bit of unhappiness. That was my fault. Apologies. Um, let's go for some. Go for that one, please. Yeah, that's what the trailing is. That. Let's just kill that. Stop that. Kill that. Start again. Yeah, so I think that's where the technology is really going to help people, um, you know, and even if I know a number of people that 
have a sort of remote setup, but it is actually in their garden as well. So that convenience factor um, is a big thing. But there is, you know, there is still then doing the visual stuff as well. I think there's room for all of this. Yeah. Um, I know some people are quite against remote setups, but to, to, to me, it's all just part of the same same hobby and it's just different facets. Yeah. And if you enjoy it, you enjoy it. If you prefer something else, well, great. You know, it's it's not an either or. No. Um, no, so I've had fun um, having a play with the two sets of data that's come out already. Mm. I mean, the, the interesting thing I've... I've learned from this is, is as I said, you know, we've put reasonably modest equipment over there. And that's the thing that I've learned, which is a, a lot of the remote setups out there, people have put huge, great mounts, huge, great telescopes over there. And actually the key thing about Spain is the number of clear skies. It isn't the equipment, you know, it isn't spending 20, 30,000 pounds on equipment. It's just wow. having those clear skies and the good sea. And then actually with modest intermediate kit in, good conditions you can go an awfully long way um mm. you can just see it coming in over here can't you and there's a little few little yeah. bits um grant do you offer this as a sort of service to other astronomy societies who, who might want to sort of have something like this on a night time sort of, oh. sort of pre-planned with uh, targets to view etc yeah um, it's it's something that's something we're growing into. So I've had a couple of people ask me about that now. And as I say, I, I've been offering it to my local society. Um, I really do need to do it with the forum next, because if I don't, I'm going to get shot. Um, um, and, and also we've been asked with some local societies down in Exeter, because I'm, I'm actually in Bedfordshire, um, but we've been asked to do it for um, like the Norman Lockyer Observatory, because... Rob, who um, runs our workshop, is a member there and, and things like that. So there's a few people in the queue and I think we'll see how it how it pans out with them. But I would really like to open it up to others. Um, at the moment, there's no easy way for me to do it other than for me to be here sort of hosting it and, and driving, which I'm happy to do. But, but you know, obviously I, I can't necessarily do that every, every night. Um, but one of the things we're exploring is whether we could make it something that people could use literally themselves and, and they could log in and and drive it themselves but that would take a bit of training and obviously um there's some security issues and stuff we need to get our heads around um but it's certainly something we're, we're considering and heading towards did you say you use the uh, excuse me <laughs> no i thought i just think did it be a good idea and i think you get a lot of data up. I just said, I think it'd be a good idea and that, and that you'd get probably a lot of take up from uh, astronomical societies yeah, well, I, I think, yeah, especially at the moment, I mean, you know, I've been quite lucky because our local society, we've done a lot through, through Zoom. Um, we've really embraced it and it's, it's worked really well for us. And actually, um, I dare I say, I think we've done more through Zoom than we, we would normally, over, especially over the summer anyway. Um, but I, not all societies, I guess, have, have done stuff through, through Zoom and have caught up. So I, I definitely think there's an opportunity to help people sort of transition to this new normal of of us all being sat at home and um yeah i i, I i'm excited about the potential of, of this kind of stuff um, yeah. you know I, I get a kick out of it and, and i hope others others do as well so if there's more we can do um it'd be, it'd be great um i think i think you were right whoever was saying that it might be a bit bit of a challenge tonight because I'm not sure we're getting much more come out here. Um, the Wait, image scan is probably a bit too high. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a few popping up, isn't there? I mean, let me yeah. see if I can just get that background any... Um, I could almost do with like, zoomed in. The other thing is the field, doesn't it? I mean, the, the field actually is lovely. You can see the quintet, so, yeah, just bang there and... Uh, I, I just sometimes think it gives a lovely sense of, of, of the universe generally, if you yeah. these wide field views are super, yeah. Well, it's like Mark, Mercurian's chain, isn't it? That just blows yeah. my mind every time. Yeah. It's just yeah. astonishing. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, is there any other requests yeah. for objects? Any other questions for Grant? Or requests for objects? Yes, Grant. Is there uh, any chance of uh, finding the ring nebula? 
<laughs> yeah, there is. It's quite small in this field of view, but I, it's something I did go to the other day, so I'll happily do it again. Um, I tried last night and I couldn't find it. M57, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's right, yeah. I always get it confused with dumbbell, which is M27. I always, in my head, they just, yeah. I have to say, I had a super vision. We actually, um, uh, we did open up the observatory at Lecture of the other week, just because we hadn't been used since well, last year, essentially. So we had to go up there and check the roof and stuff was operating. And we did actually fire the telescope up and had a visual look at M57. And for a 14 inch, it was, it was glorious. It was, um, mm -hmm. it's a very long focal length mead. So actually it was not a bad scale. Whereas sometimes you look at it visually and it's so tiny, um, you think you've missed it. Um, and a stonking view of Mars as well, I have to say. That was mm -hmm. really great. Did, did you say you're using the um, SXV694? It, yeah, it is the 694 we're using, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because that looks like a really similar field of view to what I've got with my setup. And I've got the FLT98. Oh, yeah, like yeah. 70 degrees by 40 odd degrees. Yeah. It's almost identical. Great. Yeah. It's a nice chip. I mean, um, obviously, as time goes on, we'll probably chop and change bits of equipment to test different things and try different things, different cameras. Mm -hmm. But I think the 694 has been such a reliable place to start. And yeah. I, I'll confess, I was becoming a bit of a CMOS convert, and um, it's what I use in the UK. I've got the WO stuff sat next to me now. And actually, I think for the remote stuff, the 694 is just so sensitive and so clean, so low noise. It's, yeah. it's really Absolutely. easy to process compared to um, yeah. some of the noisier chips. It's so many chips, it's lovely. But you, yeah. you can get a slightly bigger chip, can't you, in the, in the, um, in the uh, 681 or 683 USI? Yeah. yeah. Which is the same sensor size, isn't it? But smaller pixels, is that? Why? Oh, I don't know. Let's hmm. let this stack up a little bit. Hmm. Oh, do you know what? I know exactly what I've done it again, haven't I? I should have. Yeah. yeah. Guiding. Yeah. That was me. That that teach me to be showing off the guiding graph because I don't actually need guiding. <laughs> so, uh, let's um, let's just stop that because otherwise that's going to catch me out every single time. When you do it in Sequence Generator Pro, it stops the guiding for you automatically, moves, and then starts it again. And the same when you focus, it actually pauses the guiding. Um, so if you let the machine do it, it doesn't make the human mistakes that, that I'm making. It shows for paying attention, Grant. <laughs> Let's give it a few seconds to. So what what is doing there? What is the six nine four chip? Um, so the six nine four is a Sony Sony CCD chip. So it's actually it's been around a while now. The six nine four and um, pretty pretty tried and tested, but it's very very sensitive. And I think it's probably one of the best examples of a CCD chip. What what a CCD chip can do. Um, it's not huge, as I said, it's not a huge chip, um, but it's, it's very, very sensitive. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if it stacks this time. Why is it not stacking? Um, what you sometimes can do is just, um, have a look at one of the raw exposures and then try and understand okay Probably there, yeah. so it's there so that's just one exposure so why is it not stacked so it looks like it's not matching up enough stars for some reason um uh, why would it not i've had this happen a few times and i i don't know whether it's a software thing or, or quite what the issue is but you can see there we've obviously caught it and there's obviously stars there um but for whatever reason so that's just a single 20-second uh, uh, okay. frame. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether this is a... The, the software hasn't hasn't been sort of um, up, updated for quite a few years now, so I don't know whether there's some some bugs, and particularly when there's a lot of stars in the field that it's picked up. So you can see here it's picked up um, 1,200 stars, but for some reason it hasn't been able to match any of them, which makes no sense to me. Um, so yeah, not quite sure why. Um, 
let's um let's just see if I can get it to work. Um, what does your PhD say it's doing, Grant? I've turned PhD off now. Oh, okay. Let's, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let's double check. Yeah, there we go. We're off. We're off. Um, let's see what happens. I have to say, considering it's supposed to be cloudy in Spain, we've, we've done okay. Um, That's right. Yeah, I, for whatever reason, it just won't stack this particular targets, and I, I've got no idea why. Um, I don't think it's... Um, it's certainly not lack of stars. I don't think it's focus. It might, you know, the focus might need a little tweak, but it's not far enough off that I would imagine that would be an issue. Um, so, uh, yeah, not sure on that one. But anyway, you can very clearly see it, can't you? It's, um, yeah, certainly can. It doesn't need much yeah. exposure. The camera would, would be really, really nice for this sort of outreach stuff. The other thing that would be nice is an invert on this because there's times like um, on the last um, set of objects, Stephen's Quintet, if you could invert it, I think some of those galaxies would pop out um, a lot more. Should we, try, should we try another one? Why not? What do people fancy? What else have we got? Um, Can we get a view of Mars, please? Uh, oh, small, wouldn't it be? We, I've tried to get planets before, and, and uh, they're just so tiny with this setup. And that's what's nice. that's what's made me push to get a planetary setup um, for that, because then it'd be fantastic to bounce between two different scopes um, for the for the planetary stuff. So yeah, I, I think Mars would be so tiny. I, I don't think you'd see any details. The other thing is. CCD cameras are just not well suited for, um, for, for planetary. It's quite hard to get a small enough exposure to actually not blow it out because it's just so so sensitive and it's just not geared up for those really, really high speed exposures. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend Mars. Um, we, we did okay getting the moons of, of Jupiter, but you couldn't really see any detail on Jupiter itself because of that. What about... Um uh, the book cluster. Yeah. Uh, what's the... Uh, I don't, I NGC 884. NGC 884? Mm. There we go. It's one of my favourites. It's a funny object though, isn't it? Because I... It's an object I don't believe I've ever seen a picture as good as it looks visually. No, right, yeah. Do you know what I mean? That. I think it's just such a fantastic visual object, and and for whatever reason, photos just don't ever seem to capture it in the same yeah. way. The first time I saw it was a I had a ten inch dob, and it was just immaculate. Mm. And since that, I've had other scopes, and it it looks still great, but it's never been the same as in the dob. See, I, I'm, I'm a big believer that I think certain objects are made for certain telescopes. Um, yeah. so I, I really think M13 is made for a C11. I, I don't care what anyone says. I've never had such a good view of M13 as I had for a C11. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and trying other scopes, I've never quite captured that same field of view, that same sense. I, you know, I, uh, let's have a look and see what we get. Right, guiding is off. I'm not going to make that mistake again. <laughs> it's why you have to have more than one telescope, isn't it? That's, that's I was going to say, it looks a lot like the ring nebula. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens. I mean, you, you can actually save the rules as you go along with this and then come back to them and, and kind of restack and process them later, if you, if you like. I've not right. done it, but it's quite a handy... Um, Quite a handy feature.
with a bit of time to stack in the background. Okay. I suspect this is going to be a tricky one to because it's going to be quite because of the size. Yeah, it's yeah, going to be yeah. quite spaced out, isn't it? So you're not really yeah. going to get. Talk, some... talk, yeah, it's overpowered, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. that's going to. Object no. really for the size. Um. What about a narrowband object, particularly as the moon potentially? Is that what we were heart and souls right next door, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, why not? Try and have a look at the soul. It's probably a better field of view than um, the heart. What I'll do as well, if you don't mind just hanging on a, a moment, I will um, change to a HA filter and just refocus. Um, oh, come on. Is anybody getting any clear skies in the UK tonight? Not here. <laughs> I'm just going to stick my head out and look now. <laughs> I was just checking, it looks like it's cloudy. Mm. Had a good few clear nights, didn't we, recently? Probably three or four on the trot, I should think. But what was a week ago? What well, seems like a one. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Uh It's quite cloudy. Uh, Colin, I think you're trying it's to speak in the morning. We can't call him. Uh, I've sort of had a look out of Venus and Mars. The Sort of heads above my head o'clock in the morning I've been uh, sort of getting uh, some clear skies uh, particularly I've seen Venus and Mars on the evening peaking above my house my my internet's a little bit unstable at the moment again Dave believe it or not yeah you haven't paid your bill Colin <laughs> thanks for that Glenn <laughs> Ooh, we're not, that'll be the issue there then. Um, I don't know whether is that too close to the moon or is it too low down? Let's have a struggling to focus. Where are we? Uh, 22 degrees altitude. So. It should be okay. What's what's uh, unless that is just yeah, that might just be a bit on the low side. Um, let me flick to a different um, narrowband target just quickly and then refocus on that because we're just not getting anything there. So it's got nothing to yeah. go on. So it just picks up the noise. You can see it's yeah. thinking bits of noise of the stars and then gets itself in a bit of a pickle. Uh, right. Let's try, um, let's try uh, Veil if that's okay. Um, yeah. uh, which is pretty high up. Where's my button? Um, actually, if we go Pickering's Triangle, that would be quite a nice. Um, it's quite a nice little object to have a look at. Um, I 
Uh, Grant, Tony's put a couple of things in the chat. Um, let me find the chat screen. Sorry, I. Cool. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to talk to anyone about um, the, the, either the setup we've got or remote hosting generally, because actually now we've, we've done it, we've, we've gained quite a bit of experience um, in, in what it takes. And uh, I've got some really good partnerships with, with the guys over there in, in Spain. Um, I think that, that'll be the next one is, is wanting one in Chile as well, just so we've got the kind of a, a spread. I think that'll be, uh, that'll be very fun. Let's see if we can pick some up this time. Looks better. Can see some stars this time. See, it's picked it up just from the autofocus. You can see some detail com coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So we should get some some nice stuff here. I think that's the other, the other thing I would say about the the live stacking stuff. It does show you things in a different way, obviously, to what you'd see them visually, and and will often bring out stuff that you would never have a hope of seeing visually, but it isn't quite full on imaging because it does build up in front of you. I think it's, mm. it's kind of somewhere in between. It's, I guess, um, EAA. Unfortunately, the, the H alpha takes a bit longer to focus. A lot less light coming through, isn't there? Yeah, long, long, long green. Long green. <laughs> but also much, much tighter stars once it does get focused. Yeah, you were talking about um, spectroscopy earlier. You've got a talk coming up about it, um, which I'll be, I'll be very interested to, to come along to. But um, it's something um, Starlight Express have been developing a remote um, uh, spectrograph um, that can be tuned and adjusted um, through, through software rather than manually. Um, so it's something that I'd look to possibly send over to Spain to have a play around with doing some, some remote stuff with that, um, which I think could be fun. Grant, if you want to come in on Tom Field's talk, then please, you're welcome. Yeah, I'd be very interested. We've been looking for somebody to do a, a, a talk for Stargazing because quite a few people have asked for a spectroscopy talk. Yeah. There's a lot of interest in it, isn't there? But I don't think there's that many people doing talks about it and, and educating people about it. So it's kind of a bit intimidating. I, well, I think it's a bit intimidating to get into spectroscopy. It's an alternative to astrophotography, so... Grant, you, um, you, Alan, and Mendip, uh, astronomers, does an excellent talk. He's a real expert in the subject. Ah, uh, Hugh, was it Hugh Allen? Hugh yeah. Allen, yeah. He's yeah, the man. Hugh Allen. He's the man. Very good. Yeah, he was the guy that I attended the uh, spectroscopy course a couple of years ago. Okay. He's a member of the Wells and Mendip astronomers. Oh, okay. I'll have a dig. So I mean, there is, I think there is a lot of interest out there in spectroscopy, but there is obviously there's a barrier to entry to a certain extent. And I, personally, I think there's a, a knowledge barrier that I haven't 
overcome yet. Yeah, he's done a couple of talks at our society over the last couple of years and he's very, very good. Yeah. I'll drop him a line. So I've up the exposure a little bit on this um, to 30 seconds, just because it, it might take that little bit more uh, being hydrogen alpha. Let's see what we get. Oh, sorry, I, I, missed, I, I missed the question there from Tony asking about the cost of remote leasing. Um, I don't, Tony, I'm not sure if you're, you're, yeah, you're still there. So, um, obviously, I'm in the very lucky position that um, I haven't had to pay for the kit. It's the company's kit. We'll send it out there for a period of time and then we'll swap it over and sell stuff off as clearance or, or whatever. But the actual cost of the remote hosting, um, I believe Pixel Skies is £300 a month for your your space and your um your internet connection and your power and everything else so it's it's that once your kit's in there that's that's everything and then i think for that you get so many hours of remote hands as well where dave will actually you know adjust bits and pieces clean filters for you or you know tweak back focus distances whatever you need there's an element of that that you get each month and then you can pay for more of that if you if you need more support from from them um, there is also an upfront cost, an installation cost, and um, they were phenomenal with that. They really were. As I was talking about earlier, the cabling job they did, they really, it got to the point where they, they installed all the software, they did all the modeling, all the polar alignment. So the first time I logged in was to a ready-to-go machine, and it really did feel like I was cheating. Um, but because they know what they're doing, and you know, for them it's, it's much quicker, and also... I think it then means they know what kit's in their observatory and they know how to support it for you because they installed it. Um, if you want to, you can travel over there and take your kit and then install it yourself with their support. Um, obviously, at the moment, I don't know how um, how much of that is, is possible. Um, but we sent over a man in a van, which was actually much cheaper than using a courier. Um, there's various... Um, uh, services where there's people in the UK who travel over to Spain or other countries on a regular basis and you just book you know book space in a van and that was much cheaper than a courier and uh, meant we could send it packaged in the way we wanted it packaged rather than for couriers so as you can imagine because we sent over a metal pier if we'd sent that via DHL or something like that it would have cost an absolute fortune so actually the the man in a van service worked worked really well um, but we just had to wait for it to fit with the schedule of those kind of services, if that makes sense. Um, and, and then, yeah, Dave and Colin turned it around in a few days. I think there's a YouTube video actually of them putting it all together. Um, there was a couple of mistakes we made um, about missing bits and pieces or missing adapters. We thought we'd got everything we needed, but invariably there's, there's odds and ends, but they have quite a good stock of cables and adapters and bits and pieces. They have a few rules about um, what you, not rules is the wrong thing, but there, there's a few recommendations about kit they recommend you send over there simply because of reliability, but also things like they recommend a certain brand of USB cable just because in their experience, it's much more reliable and they don't really want to be going out plugging USB cables in and out all night long. So there's, there's bits and pieces that you can kind of get from their knowledge and experience of, of doing this for quite a while now. Um, which is, is definitely worth um, using. Um, it's Lindy cables they recommend, by the way, um, which are, are pretty pretty reliable. Thank you very much, that Grant. No worries. Uh, we, we're in the, we're planning uh, planning lots of things, but we, we're planning to build sort of a mini website for this project, rather than hosting bits and pieces all over the place. So when we do that, we will put the the video on there and, and some sort of more information about how it works um, and the you know, bits and pieces we, we use and why. Um, that's coming in quite nicely. I don't know if you, um, I don't know if we can tweak it a little bit more. Um, so there we go. 
Um, just getting these sliders in. You could do like a zoom on the sliders, really, just to kind of really yeah. finely um, control. Um, because I suspect if I could, or if I could put a number in, I could possibly just, just eke out a tiny bit more, but um, you'll find just leaving it running, running what we're up to 10, 30 seconds there, it will just keep coming and coming. And, and you know, there's some really nice kind of filament structure coming out already. Um, yeah. It's a nice, nice object. It would actually frame quite nicely, that would, if I'd centred it a bit better. Um, but I suspect it would be quite a um, quite a panorama to get the whole of uh, whole of it in with this field of view, um, which could be a fun project. Yeah, excellent. Cool. Well, I, I, I'm yeah. more than happy to, to bounce around some some objects if people want me to. Uh, I'm equally happy to stop talking and uh, leave you all to enjoy your evenings. Really, I'm. I'm uh, it's up to up to you guys. <laughs> Well, it's your time, Grant. So uh, you know, it's, uh... <laughs> I did warn you about this, Dave. I did. I said I could talk forever. So um, I, if we're going to be last man standing, I, I <laughs> you'll have to shut me up at some point. What about the dumbbell? That that'll be a bit bigger than the uh, ring. Yeah, um, we're still on HA. What do we reckon? Try that in HA. HA. Uh, is there much in HA? Because I know there's a lot in O3, isn't there? It'd be O3, wasn't it? So I could change to. Why, why don't we try HA and then I'll change to O3 if. if because the the outer parts of it are HA, aren't they? And they, but they take a long exposure, don't they? Um, let's give it a go. I'll, I'll um, let's, let's give it a go. Oh, M twenty seven. I told you I get them mixed up. <laughs> Hasn't got far to go either. No, no, just around the corner. There's a nice thing about the 10 micro mounts as well. They really do fly around. Their slew speed is incredible. He says. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's probably gone all the way round. It's probably one of those. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Uh, they're in a. Yeah. Yeah. I bet it comes in from. It's a meridian, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there it is. Oh, there, he, there he goes. And then it comes back. There we go. All right. Um, Let's, um, I tell you what, the O3 and the HA probably aren't going to be too much different in terms of focus points. So let me let me change to the O3 and then just see if I need to refocus, I will. But as you saw before, it's a few minute process, which is um, I need to set my offsets up. I'm going to have a look out the back, see what it's uh, doing out there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's not bad for 30 seconds. Oh, I oh. oh wow. <laughs> I mean, you're already getting that outer kind of edge, which can be trickier to pick up in the UK. I've switched to the stack for you now, so it will, um, just got to wait. <laughs> So you're adding that to the list of future objects, Grant? Absolutely. I, I like the field of view as well. I'm, 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 I'm a big fan of, of things in their context, if, if that yeah. makes sense. I, I don't like it when the field of view is so tight, you don't get a bit of stars around it. So 
to me, I, I really enjoy that field of view. Um, oh, look at that. There we go. That. Lovely. Mm. I think this is, this is also showing you, you know, we haven't got any darks or calibration frames here. And it's reasonably, you know, it's pretty smooth. Um, oh, yeah. Telling me my internet connection's unstable now. Got a virus off me, Dave. <laughs> Probably. Look at that nice detail coming out in there now. There is, isn't there? Some really nice detail down here starting yeah. to come to come through. Oh, cool. So this is with the uh, moon up <laughs> and not a properly clear night. It's pretty high, isn't it? So that, 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 it is pretty, that does help, yeah. There's quite a bit of structure coming. Grant, how many hours of data would you take for something like that? You were talking about 80 hours previously. Yeah, I, I mean... Uh, this, as I said, this may be as much my sort of inexperience of doing such long because prior to this, the most I'd ever hoped to get of, of any object is maybe 10, 15 hours um, because I didn't have a permanent setup in the UK. So trying to do longer, um, longer hours on targets over multiple nights was almost impossible. So unless I got a particularly good night or was it a star party, I, I'd really struggle. So I went all in and I was kind of the first few objects I was trying to get 100 hours and now I've cut it down to 80 hours. But I suspect something like this actually you know probably 30 40 hours it's going to be then diminishing returns after that point where yeah. you know there's so low noise anyway you've got all the detail you're probably going to get um and I, you know the, the advice i've had from a few people is you get to the point where you're, you're probably not actually adding anything so for this because it's quite nice and bright i probably would have a look after 48 40 hours and that's what i've also been doing now is in as I talked about earlier, I don't just try and get all of the all of the HA and then all of the O3. I try and get a, a, a mix as I go. So I probably would look after 48 hours and just see where are we up to and, you know, try, take a judgment call, do a very rough process and just see what's actually there. Um, and, and then maybe, you know, if, if you look at the quality of data and you think, OK, the O3 is lacking a little bit, I could come back and do an extra chunk on the O3. So that's how I'm playing it now. Um, it is almost be a bit more led by the object and the conditions at the time, um, rather than kind of specifically saying I want 80 hours. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm learning um, as much as anyone on this, probably more, probably more than anyone. So I, I'm very happy to take any advice anyone has on, on what they think is, is good numbers. Um, I mean, the the Pixins like weighted preprocessor seems to do a very good job now as well of, of sorting out any dodgy frames or, or poorer quality stuff. Um, so I think I think we're kind of in a golden age with software at the moment. Mm -hmm. Knowing how to use it, I think, is the uh, the tricky bit. Yeah, so many different ways of using this software as well. I mean, that's the incredible thing about Pix Insights, isn't it? Is it is just a box of tools. Um, I've, not, I've not used it, so yeah, I mean, I've had any experience with that one at all? Every single time I've watched someone do a demo, there's there's different different ways of doing it, different sequences of of the way you do it, you know, different approaches. Um, so I, I really do see it as you, you are giving, a, you know, someone a toolbox full of stuff and it's then away you go, go and build something with it. And, you know, I think it just then means you've got to invest a lot of time and, and effort into learning those tools to get the best out of it. Um, and, then, and then you realise, as I have recently, that 
it doesn't even quite work like that because each object, most people then have a slightly different process on that particular object. So there's not one pre-described way of, of, of doing things. Um, oh. And it's, yeah, I, it's why I've been quite interested to see different people's approaches because I know some people that will spend hours and hours and hours doing their processing and then other people that will spend an hour and get what I think is very, very acceptable results. And it's, again, it's that diminishing returns thing, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, how far do you want to go with things? How much do you want to polish? Um, yeah. That's coming in lovely, isn't it, now? It is really nice, yeah. 13, 13 stacks there. Um, 30 seconds. It's definitely a project. Yeah, definitely. 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 Well, it'll be interesting as well to see how far you can get this dust outwards as well. You know, how, how much you can push it. Um, yeah, Rachel, processing life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll save this one as well because um, it's worth a little uh, play. Um, Cool. Um, Excellent. I was going to just suggest one one last object to finish the night, if that's okay with everyone, which is um, try, and, try and do the pelican. Why not, yes. That came out really nicely the other day, um, and it's it's quite high up again. Um, uh, and we can flip back to HA for it. Um, let's get my... Field of view, right? Where were we there? I think the, the other thing I'd say about this is in terms of outreach stuff is um, with, with kids, you know, I, I, we've done a lot of outreach stuff up at the observatory and um, the tricky thing is, is it is hard. If you've never looked for an, an eyepiece, it's hard to understand where to put your head, how to get it just right, how to get a nice view. And if you've then got a queue of 20, 30 people and you've got, you know, you've got to give people one or two minutes each, it can be very challenging. And I think having stuff on screen you know as i say it doesn't replace that visual view but it, it does it is something it is it is worthwhile i believe um for outreach yeah i mean if you showed this, if you showed this to my kids it would blow their mind you know my little boy would love that picture yeah i think it's a grant if you are doing that sort of outreach you could uh, uh talk to them prior to sort of mm. zooming in for want of a phrase yeah and get them to select a X number of uh, objects amongst themselves yeah. to sort of then pass back to you. So you've got a fixed time for yes. yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and be able to do it that way. And I, and I think I, I, it's hard to explain, but in my mind, the fact this is live means it's different to just throwing up a picture we find on Google. I, yeah, I don't know why, but it, it, there's something different about something being kind of appearing in front of your eyes and you know that somewhere there's a telescope moving around the sky and there's photons hitting a camera. You know, there, there's something different. Um... Well, I recently uh, stepped down as chair of the West Yorkshire Astronomical Society. And having something like this uh, for the members would be great because a lot of the members aren't particularly sort of au fait with uh, a lot of uh, in-depth astronomy. But seeing something sort of emerge on screen like this, I think would be a real sort of uh, pulling for people. Mm. And let's, I mean, let's not, let's not, you know, mess around here. There's, there's a lot of people that are interested in astronomy, but not interested enough to go out in a cold night with the risk yep. of it clouding over. Whereas this, there's no inconvenience to people. You know, Saturday night when it didn't, you know, our, our, our moon stuff didn't go ahead. No one had lost anything. Whereas if we'd physically had an event, we would have had to call it off a day before because you couldn't have left it to the last minute. So it, 
it's it's as I say, it's an ad for me. It's an it's an and, not an not an or. Um, it adds, not not replaces. I mean, there you go. One, one even, yeah. even in the no, raw, I mean, it, you can it, see it, that structure in the neck of the pelican there, can't you? In the back of the neck. Incredible. I, I think the bit I I miss and. Dave, you'll be way, way better at this than me, is being able to then talk over the objects and, and fill in some of the science and some of the context. And I, I think that's where, with a talk like this, we could almost do with two people, me driving and then someone who's got more science knowledge than I have um, to, to talk over the top and explain to people, you know, what they're looking at, how that was created. Um, Well, we have got National Astronomy Week coming up, Grant, so... Uh... Well, yeah, I'm very, very happy to support anything like this. Um, you know, for, for me, it's, it's, it's just, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy it. I, I really get a kick out of it, so I'm very happy to, to join in. I mean, the, the, the structure coming out here is yeah. lovely, isn't it, up here? It's really... Come in a little bit. I think this is a fantastic object to, to image. Um, it is, yeah. You know, there's, you know, there's a lot of people out there now with, with red cats, and this is a lovely object in a red cat because um, you can get the North American nebula as well, and it's just a beautiful field of view. I think the other thing missing from this kind of remote stuff at the moment is um, solar. Um, you know, again, um, the weather we have here in the UK, I think there's a real opportunity to have a remote um, accessible solar setup. Um, it's a little bit more challenging because the, um, the setups in Spain will only open at night uh, and people are not expecting them to open during the day so their kit won't be shielded or closed you know so there's no way they, they could open them for the risk of everyone else's kit so we would have to have a, a specific setup um, for for solar but it's something I'm, I'm looking at uh, I think we've got a few couple of years really until the the activity is enough to warrant something like that but I think that could be really really interesting that'd be interesting yeah Because I took up solo, what, about five or six years ago, was it? Just to, just to keep me occupied during the summer, really. And very quickly, totally hooked. Yeah. Because yeah. you just don't know what you're going to see when you get out of there. You can look at the HA um, images online, but mm. they give you a sort of an idea, but you just don't know. You set up, and all of a sudden you see something pop out, and it, wow, weren't expecting that. That's, yeah, amazing. Sun's just incredible. I inadvertently caught the uh, ISS going over the uh, face of the sun when I was in Portugal doing some uh, daytime. Uh, uh, I'm very jealous. I'd, I'd love, and uh, I was chuffed to bits with myself. Yeah, I'd love to catch the ISS. I keep looking at the the Transit Finder website and, and hoping we get a a good one. Um, yeah. We tried doing that as a live Zoom thing with our local society and um, unfortunately it was cloudy, but had it not been cloudy, it only would have been like a, a quarter of a second or a third of a second. Uh, so it's quick once it happens, yeah. I'm not sure what, you know, live, I'm not sure how good an experience it would have been, but, you know, if we could have then played it back, um, that would have been quite cool. Yeah. Um, this is clearing up really nicely. You can see a lot of, a lot of dark structure coming through yeah. here. Um, all up here through the neck. Wonderful stuff. Cool. Excellent. I see we drop it drop down to fourteen now. <laughs> so so <they're> yeah. <laughs>
Well, well I think, as I say, I think brilliant. We, Thanks, Grant. If, if, if we leave it on this subject and, and, and call it a night there, but I'm, I'm more than happy. If there's ever anything you guys, you know, if there's something interesting to look at or you want me to come back and do do some more stuff, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Um, and as I say, I hope to do stuff like this, um, specifically to have particular sort of virtual star party nights. And what I'd really like to do is try and get some other people to share their screens as well. So if it is clear in the UK and, and be able to bounce between different people, different setups and have a sort of a virtual star party. So um, yeah, maybe that's something we could, we could put together. Uh, in yeah, the now the evenings are darker, we've got more chance of doing that now. So, uh, Definitely. You know, so I can, I can actually run the virtual astronomy club from the shed. Yeah, done that before, and then just live stream through the telescopes. That'd be good fun to do. Yeah, I, I think so. And then, and then having you know access to Spain as sort of a backup if it, a bit of cloud does come over. You know, hopefully chances are it will be clear in Spain. Um, but yeah, I think that's that would be good fun. Yeah, excellent. Well, brilliant. Thanks so much, Grant. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for the feedback as well. Uh, lots of cool feedback in the chat. So really appreciate that, guys. And uh, been a pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, much. Grant. Night, night everybody. Great. Night. Thanks everyone for coming in. And nice uh, you know what we're going to say? <laughs> keep <laughs> safe. <laughs> keep well. <laughs> keep looking. Keep looking up. Night, all. Bye. 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 Bye.